To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Um, And guys, what's so fun about this is doing little explorations and trying to figure out different parts of Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, you know, this surrounding area of Washington, D.C. And one area that I got to learn a little bit more about is when I went down to Richmond for DWR when they asked me down there, um, Alex McCrickard, Mike Minarski, and I learned a little bit more about the Richmond area. And then I guess because it was in my mind, I started looking through social media and websites to try to get more information. And I hopped upon this really cool website that I just started to binge at 2, 2 a.m. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to reach out on Instagram, see if this guy would want to come on because he seems like the source for some really cool things that are happening in Richmond. And the, this is not the Richmond of old. Richmond is a cleaner city. It's a beautiful city now. It's got tons of cool waterways. It's not like from like the 1970s or anything. And the best person is Andrew Knight. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Thomas. And uh, excited to get other people uh, excited about the James River and fishing. I've grown up here my whole life and have been, you know, just wading through the river as a young child and excited to be here as an adult and uh, getting more people uh, can I information about what what types of fishing are on the James River and especially the Shad Run that's coming up uh, as we speak. So sometimes if we get a passion project, we will do certain things. Not put in guys again. A link in the episode description. This is a banging website. Uh, you put a lot of effort into this. How did this? I need. What's the story here? Yeah, great question, and I'm I'm really fortunate to get to have the opportunity to share more about it because. I think people often in the social media world, they kind of just see the content and they just assume that it's either something that I, you know, it's my, but I work on it every day as a social media manager and that's not the case. But uh, the reason I created the RVA James River Fishing Report was um, I was in graduate school studying communication and public relations. And it was during the COVID era, right? When everyone was kind of back uh, at home and kind of stuck either being outside or, you know, indoors. And I saw that, here in Richmond, Virginia, up until Current Culture Fly Shop was created, I'm not sure if you talked to Alex about that at all, but we actually don't have a local tackle shop that's true and try right downtown in the heart of the city. And with that, we don't have content and river updates and guides to help people access the James River. I mean, the James River is known for being one of the best urban kayaking destinations. We get Richmond gets all these accolades for being an outdoor you know, urban outdoor scene, but there's not a lot of focus on the fishing, even though we have these amazing, uh, you know, striper, shad runs every spring. We have awesome, you can catch trophy smallmouth in the heart of downtown Richmond. I mean, huge catfish, tons of bluegill. And I just feel like people are kind of overlooking this gym that you literally drive around everywhere you go. And you, there's bridges and there's just a lot of focus on the river. And I, I'm a mountain biker as well. And I'm always, you know, biking along the trail. We get talked a lot about as having a great mountain biking scene, but there's not a lot of focus on fishing in the James River. Green Top is a big tackle shop a lot of people are familiar with in the area, but they're not, I mean, they're 30, 25 minutes away from downtown Richmond in the heart of the city. And so there's no one going out every day. I saw a, a, just a simple hole that was somebody going out and posting river conditions, you know, the water temperature, the, you know, different gauge heights, and also a gap in kind of people sharing what they're catching in the James River and kind of all the success you could have by just kind of walking out your back door 
in the heart of the city in downtown Richmond and then going on the river. So I said, you know what? I'm really passionate about communication and kind of helping the community get engaged. I've been fishing my whole life and I want to help other people go out and go fishing on the James River. And I just started posting. I'd go down to the river. Um, you know, it's been a couple hours just kind of fishing and taking videos and just kind of doing, I, I got to know the, understand the gauges really well. And so I really got to understand, you know, if we got rain up in Lynchburg or up in the mountains, kind of the couple days in between before we kind of flood the, you know, kind of bump the river up locally in Richmond. And I just saw it as a way to kind of create content that helps people get excited about fishing on the James River and kind of to be in the know. You see these, you know, RVA trail reports, you see them for the skiing report. I'm a big surfer. I've got a wave in the background. There's a surf report where you can go, you know, on surf line, see what the river, see what the waves are going to be before you go. But there's nobody who is actively going out and posting uh, videos of what the river looks like and kind of highlighting local people catching fish. And I just saw a need for that. And so I started posting content. I will say uh, last year, it kind of started to take off a little too much time. I mean, I would get off my job. I would go down. I would create, you know, film. I would try to fish as much as I could to be actually, you know, doing the work. And I love fishing. Uh, but then I would come home, you write up the description, look at the gauges. And it's just gotten to be a huge endeavor. Um, and people sometimes ask, like, you know, are you trying to make money? What's your, I had someone kind of critique me once saying that I was using the money to buy a John boat or something. I've actually never taken a dollar. Uh, I've sold some merch and I was all to kind of create uh, the pay and I, the money I made off the merch. Uh, most of it went to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and then the rest of it went to pay my friend who designed our, uh, our graphics for the RVA Jam Bureau Fishing Report. And so I haven't made a dollar yet, but I'm just here for the community to help people get excited. We can go outside and catch, someone can go outside for the first time and catch a fish. Maybe they'll want to protect the river and uh, see the value a little bit more. How many years ago are you, how long are you into this now? This is year two and a half. Oh my goodness, dude. That's but, awesome. But the, 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 the other issue I was seeing with my website and the reason I wanted to create the website was a lot of people have fun stories they'll share with me you know i went down the river i had this huge small mouth on but right before i got it in the net you know it jumped off and i'm like we need to have a space we need to have a blog where people i'm here oh you're good people are telling 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 the stories and sharing the information and the other thing was people were coming into town i would get you know four or five direct messages a day saying hey i'm here visiting from dc you know where can i go fishing on the james river there's no website that says the different put-ins. So I decided, all right, we need to house the content. We're going to have vlogs. I wrote nine different guides and I write, I work for a public relations firm. So I write a lot of content blogs. I do a lot of media relations. I'm writing all day for my full-time job. And I said, you know what? I need to start writing for fishing. It's where my passion is. And uh, it's cool to get to apply that to something I'm really, really passionate about. This is also, cause I know I do have a lot of a young, youngins listening that really want to get into the fishing industry. You know, this is my, this is my, basically my side job that breaks even. I don't, I am not, I'm not retiring off of this. And then beforehand, before I got the regular job I had now, I was working two jobs. But the thing is guys, if you're doing something you're passionate about, you find time, you find the energy. You know, I think when people think of a job, they think of something that's just completely soul sucking and not fulfilling when you can find stuff. And if you follow your passion, you can figure out a way to, to do something with it. And I think that's testimony that even though you write all day, you find a little bit of energy to be able to do this too. Yeah, that's a great point. I think there's so many new outlets for young people to share their stories. You know, you're seeing a lot of these YouTube anglers coming to life and those skills are relevant. I mean, when I, at my PR firm where I work, we have clients that need social media videos and reels and you can bring that to life. And I think if you're looking for that entry point into, you know, working, everyone wants to work in the fishing industry one day, use your, your passion. And you, I'm a big believer that what you're passionate about, you can do really well. And so if you're, you know, for young people looking to kind of get into the fishing industry, you know, keep creating content, keep writing, and you never know where it'll take you because, um, yeah, I'm still kind of figuring out my career path as well. You said surfing. Are you from Virginia? Because that's a very niche thing for a native Virginian to, to be passionate about. Everybody always asks, you know, <laughs> you're a surfer from Richmond. There's no waves in Richmond. Uh, but... I grew up in Richmond. I've been here my whole life, but the East Coast, uh, you know, is not Virginia Beach is not far away. And my grandparents had beach houses in Virginia Beach. And then throughout college for four summers, I worked as a lifeguard in the Outer Banks and spent four summers down there on the beach every day. And uh, my skills improved a lot. And 
I love surfing so much. I wasn't doing enough fishing down in Outer Banks, even though there's just like the mecca of, you know, redfish and off offshore fishing. But I love, I mean, I think surfing and fishing go hand in hand. I just, I don't know where you find the time for this. You have a full-time job. You do biking. You're very active. You're surfing. You're doing this. And then I think you mentioned um, before we got started here, you were a, a guide, correct? Yeah. So, uh, and and if the, your avid viewers will know that Alex from Cricker was on in the earlier show, he's actually the person that kind of helped me get into being a guide out in Wyoming on a ranch called the Abare Ranch. It's the second oldest ranch in the U.S., uh, has over 30 miles of private trout streams and uh, the North Platte River flows through it. So I worked at ABRA as a fly fishing guy for the expedition program. And what the expedition program was, it was um, every week, one family stays in the remote cabin off the ranch main property. So it's kind of like nestled up in the woods uh, without cell service. And so I was there sleeping in a tent for uh, for five months. So that was a, uh, that was a great experience and just getting to kind of be with these families and have these people help people have these amazing moments on the water and people, I was really worried going in that I wouldn't be able to appreciate fishing when I'm not the person landing the fish or casting the fly, uh, in front of the, you know, the feeding trout, but kind of being with somebody throughout the entire process, you know, saying, I think, you know, there's a lot of trout that usually, you know, hold behind that rock and that run and, you know, seeing that them kind of get my, my excitement come to them and seeing them be successful was, it almost was more rewarding than even catching the fish myself. So taking that fly fishing experience and then bringing it back home to the James, I mean, what, what's available right now for people if they don't have a boat? I mean, you're, you're in the middle of the city. Like, is there really fishing opportunities that people can take advantage of with a fly rod? Yes. Yes. With a fly rod and with a spin rod, I do both. I'm very, I mean, I'm adamant about both types, but for fly fishing, you can get your fly rod, the shad. I don't know if we're going to get into this right now, but the shad are starting to show up. My goal was to catch a shad in February, but I got it the second day of March. So I got close this year, but with the warm weather pattern we had in February, it started to, the shad started to move in a bit earlier. And, you know, with that, the striper as well. So for those of you not familiar with the shad run, they're adronomous fish species, meaning they spend most of their life out in the ocean, Atlantic ocean in the bay. And then when it comes time for them to spawn, they swim, up in the tidal rivers on the east coast and spawn when the james river reaches the 55 degree mark so right now the rivers drop back down to the low the mid 40s but it was in the, like the low 50s last week when we had that warm weather run and really the prime time you can go out there right now and catch a few shad people have been sending me reports they're seeing people catch three or four per every two hour session but in the next month, I think middle of April to end of April, it becomes total mayhem. Fly rods using a little marabou, little jig with sinking line. You want to get that line down and then spin fishermen or fisher anglers using, you know, a gold or green spoon with a half ounce uh, weight with a big three foot leader. Hmm. These shad, I mean, they, they come up in super dense numbers and there's no like rhyme or reason as to why all of a sudden you're just on them and you're catching, you know, 15, 20 in a row, but they kind of stay in the deeper channels of the river, but you can access them from the bank just like you would in the boat. So you'll see that, you know, between the I-95 bridge and the 14th Street bridge, I mean, mid-April, honestly, in the next end of March, people just line the banks casting. I mean, I have my fly rod down there. I can't get it out as far, but there, when the shad are really in there thick, when it's that 50 middle of, mid fifties temperature. I mean, they are just vicious fish. They fight so hard. I like to kind of think of each shad has made this crazy journey from the Atlantic ocean all the way up to our river. And it just, the James river becomes alive and it's just this magical spring awakening of the James river. So yeah, you got the map up there right now. They're kind of in the lower section. Um, there's no rhyme or reason why, but they're, they're kind of near the Ann Caro's area. So looking at the I-95 bridge a little bit below that, there's a public landing you can go down. Um, you're going to want to go down a little more, a little more south to the last bridge listed here. Oh, wow. This is yeah, so right. crazy that this is like in the middle of a massive city and you're doing this. Yeah. So they, they stop at the fall line, which is right in the heart of where you are kind of right here, right above so right here. Bell Island. Yep. So that's the fall line. That's where they stop. There's a ton of rapids there and they kind of can't 
they'll, they'll go up a little bit further because naturally fish continue to swim and kind of see what, push their limits. But that's kind of their, their turnaround point. And so we're really lucky. And I always say this to Richmonders, we're lucky that we happen to be at the fall line section of the James. I mean, we're hmm. right there in the rapids. So the shad will make their way up and they'll spawn and they'll go back out to sea. So it is a wonderful time of the year to be fishing. And it kind of, I kind of like to say it kind of symbolizes the start of fishing on the James River. I mean, you can fish year round and we're, I'm a huge, my dad and I, my brothers are huge smallmouth anglers. And we do that from May through about November, but the shad kind of kick it all off. Everybody can go down there. You know, I take my little brother who's like, you know, he's five years old. He's casting a little spoon and catching a shad and they fight really, really hard. We're seeing mostly hickory shad and Alex just tells me this all the time. Um, they went and shot or they went and stocked American shad to kind of try to bring them back. Unfortunately, the American shad haven't had as much of a comeback as we would have liked, but the hickory shad are in, are doing really well. And those are the mo the main type of shad you'll catch. However, the Americans are the ones that are uh, a little bit less. You're not going to see as much as many of them, but it's a good sign when you do hook into one. What is the average size of something like this? Because so example is in the bass fishing world, I'm thinking shad. I'm thinking maybe five inch thread fin. Maybe you get a gizzard that that's a little bit bigger. You don't think like this is like. And if I'm, I could be wrong, but they call it like a poor man's tarpon, correct? Yeah, the the hickories especially. They do a thing called a, like a little a tail a tail dance where when you hook into them they'll like slap their tail out across the water. But yeah, I mean this is a pretty good size. This is my buddy David. Okay. Um, I mean that's an early season shad. They seem to be a little bit bigger, but that's a classic hickory. And my brother here's got the other one on the right. And I mean they're all about you know 15 inches or so. And they're the thing is they're really they have some girth to them. They're about to spawn and they put up just this crazy fight. They are relentless. They will like they will pull drag. I mean, they will really send you on a chase. And as a fly angler, it just feels like it's it's when you hook into it, it's like you've you've hit a rock, and all of a sudden That's you're so just, cool. You're you're shaking, and it's uh, it's really really exciting, and it's really unique that we get to be in this tidal section of the, of the James River. And you mentioned fly, and I know you mentioned so uh, guys. So so for spinning, uh, you got shad darters, you got spoons, um, and then for flies, what specific presentations are you using? So with the fly rod combo, it can be a bit of a bummer if you're only looking at like if you have really lightweight setups. It, it tends to be a lot more effective if you have 350, 300 grain sinking, full sinking line. These shad are usually pretty far down. And, you know, at the sink rate of like seven seconds or seven, you know, uh, like seven inches per, per second, you kind of got to wait about like 10 seconds, just really let it kind of start the line to like really get down to the bottom. And then it's just this, you know, you have about a two foot, you know, 10 pound leader tied onto the sinking line and you're just stripping it in. The big thing with the strip is just really consistent. The shad actually aren't eating. They're just defending their eggs. So they're not like actively eating at this time. They're just hunkering down about to spawn, just kind of defending their, their eggs hmm. they're just kind of it's a reaction strike compared to a it's kind of like i i am not super familiar with like salmon fishing but i know that are like you know steelhead that come up they're kind of there's no they aren't actually eating on their way up they're just making their spawn uh, up through the river that's interesting so when when you're i mean actually you know what guys i probably should have brought the other one back up so let's just say um pick an area through here uh so i'm assuming all this is fishable right through here correct you can so, fish through here. Yeah. The, the big thing here is that the shad really, they kind of stop being in dense populations where the first rapids start. So like if you see this line of rapids all the way across, mm -hmm. yeah, this is kind of like the, the final point, but between this 95 bridge, it, they, they're pretty densely stacked between the 95 bridge and the 14 three bridge. So there's two bridges. No, you're right there, right there. Where oh, you right were. there. Okay. It's pretty tight. Like, there's a reason there's probably 200 people in the middle of April. They're all stacked. And, and if we're looking at my favorite spot, you can actually park under this 95 bridge right here. And right, yeah, right there on this, hmm. on this side closest to us on this, on the South side. And you can walk, there's a, there's a trail that goes all the way around. So you can just line the banks that way. Oh, wow. So then let's just say you're camped out there. Are, are you doing a lot of moving then? Or is it more of your camping and waiting for them to come to you? On the bank, you're, you're pretty much just doing some camping and waiting them uh, kind of waiting for them to come to you. 
The infuriating part, though, and I cannot tell you how many times this happened, is you'll you'll feel the shad or you'll see the shad based off of people you know next to you kind of move in. They're in these big schools and they show up in the deep channel. And I don't know exactly why, but there'll be the one guy to your left who's literally caught 30 in a row and you'll have maybe three or four. <laughs> it's something about the way that they, that they kind of stop in the channel that like if your shad spoon or your shad little jig or dart isn't like right in front of them it's like you're just not gonna catch them so i mean you can move around but they do the shad will move around and you'll kind of see like a it's like a wave and if you're at a basketball game where the furthest guy to the south will catch one and they'll just kind of like stack all the way <laughs> through so i mean it's cool. it's not as that choreographed as i'm saying but you'll definitely see with when people around you start to get hooked up i mean you're, you're next, but it can be that just one person's just at the, just putting it right on them every time. And you're just a little bit off and they're just a little bit, you know, in a different spot. And the same goes for people that if they have a kayak or a boat, I mean, I've been in my, I have a little John boat and I've been out there and you know, the guy to my right's just on fire and I've caught a few. So it can be frustrating, but my, my advice to anybody who's new is your time will come. And if you do, you go enough, you'll have success. That's awesome. And then uh, making sure just just because uh, I know I'm going to get some comments about this. 55 is the perfect degree water temperature. And really, your window is between now and mid-April is really going to be peak shad time. To the end of April, I'd say. End of April? Okay. And then is there any kind of special licensing or anything like that that people need to be able to go do shad fishing? No, no. You uh, All you need is a you know, Virginia fish freshwater fishing license and uh, you're good. That that is really cool. That's something again. That's on the bucket list of something that I really want to freaking catch because it's just it's such a neat thing that we have resource wise here in Virginia. With um, I mean, you have the James here. You got the uh, you got the Potomac River up where I am. You got two prime locations for the shad run. Um, and you mentioned these other fish. And guys, I'll just bring the map back up here because again, this is always floors me. And you said it best. You have Richmond right on the break line where you can catch smallmouth, shad, and striper. And you have this massive river just going right through the heart of Richmond. Um, what is the smallmouth fishing like here? Like, is it actually pretty good? Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that people that are, my dad's been fishing the river for 30 years. He's in his late fifties and he's a, a, you know, he goes probably four times a week. They, people that have been here for generations will say the small fishing has declined. And while it wasn't as good as it used to be with, you know, water temperatures changing and kind of just the ecosystem and the James, it's still really, really good. Multiple, I mean, people have sent me photos and my dad included caught trophies. You can catch trophy smallmouth literally in the heart where the teapot bridge is in the James River. Um, and it's not uncommon to go out there, especially in the earlier part of the summer and have double digit days, just throwing a little Ned rig or a little chartreuse, a uh, little grub. I mean, there are tons of smallmouth in there and the smallmouth fishing goes for a long time through the fall. And I mean, top water, throwing a little whopper plopper if you're spin fishing or a little popper if you're on the fly rod. I mean, it is so good for so long. And the thing I love about fishing on the James River is the further you wade, the more success you have because there's this huge stretch of rapids that people fish the banks, you know, but if you can get comfortable walking out and getting out where people don't go, you're going to have, mm. have a lot of success. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. And guys, again, uh, the resources that I'm using right now is straight from his website, which will be linked in the episode description uh, when this thing goes live. And so we'll go right back to his website. Because again, like, I, I, again, the amount of work and how, how often do you try to update some of these pictures and stuff? Like this is like amazingly just, oh. I can't get guys. I just know the work that goes into something like this. It's insane. And then you got the spot guide here. This is a, what made you do this? This is such a brilliant idea that boom, it's right there. Here's some areas that you can go. Was this your idea? Yeah. Um, I'd actually seen it when I was uh, fly fishing last summer out in uh, near Bozeman, Montana, visiting my brother at a ranch. And there was something similar to this. I can't say it was completely my idea, but there was something uh, for, I think it was called West Yellowstone anglers. They had a whole, I think it was like 30 different rivers in, in the kind of Montana area with all these kind of uh, details of parking and everything in between. And I decided that, you know, I, there's nothing like this in Richmond for the James River. And we have this really expansive section of river and there's no information. So that kind of seeing that other type of spot guides based out in Montana and then also 
having people continually reaching out saying, hey, I'm visiting from DC. I'm you know here for a bachelor weekend, but of course I brought my rod. Where do I go? I mean, he, I, I just kind of saw this common problem and wanted to make sure people could access the river with parking, with kind of knowing where to cast and kind of entryways to kind of make the most of their time. And so for people listening on Apple or Spotify, you can hop on over to YouTube or check out the website. But for the spot guides, for the people that are listening, uh, Pony Pasture, Wetlands, Train Trestle, uh, Nickel Bridge, Reedy Creek, uh, 42nd Street, Teapot Bridge, Pipeline, uh, 14th Street Bridge, uh, Flood Wall Park, and then Anchorage Landing, Anchorage Landing, something like that. Um, and Caras, yeah. And Caras, and Caras. There we go. Um, and that is just again brilliant. And then we're not going to go pros- into all this depth here. I want you guys to go to his website and check it out. But this is very now, now. So did you go to each spot and then take these pictures yourself? Do this due diligence, or did you just find this somewhere else? Because I, I, it's insane. Yeah, no, I took all the photos. I mean, it's honestly, I had a nice database of them from just going to the river so much and uh, you know doing the river updates, but. A few of the, uh, the fish photos with people holding fish at the spots. I did get some of the people have sent those in and give me permission to use them on the website. But yeah, it's mostly been just me. Uh, I like to say we because my dad helps me occasionally with like going down to the river and, you know, letting me know how it is. But it's pretty much a one person show. But I do rely on the community for kind of sending in their photos and kind of letting us know how they're doing. And then also just kind of building the excitement. Um, I think when other people can tell their friends about the shad fishing run and, you know, bring people down there, we can all learn to appreciate the river and uh, have more fun together. Now, have you ever thought about expanding this at some point to just other things within the Richmond limits is, or let me rephrase it. Is, are there other things outside the James that are within the Richmond limits? Any part public ponds, things of that ilk? That is a great question. There's a man who's a, a good mentor to me named John Bryan. He just created a book, called um, Exploring the James, let me, let me pull up the exact name, um, but it's like Exploring the James River. And it's all about recreating along the James River. Um, and it features, it's called uh, Friends of James River Park. Uh, so it's just this uh, kind of guidebook about everything you can do along the river. But I think it would be great to kind of, it talks about, you know, hiking, swimming, floating down the James, but it'd be great to kind of, you mean, create like a website with every local pond and like all the conditions for that. I, I was just thinking for you to just expand a little bit um, because I mean, you already got the market cornered here and I don't mean like way outside of Richmond, but I did look uh, before we started recording that there's tons of little ponds. It seems like within Richmond too, that you could just own that yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be cool. I mean, that's a great idea. And people ask me, yeah, what is the next steps? And I'm always open for ideas. So it's great to, you know, meet somebody like yourself who creates such great content and is kind of working to tell the stories. And uh, yeah, I'm open to, to expanding. When did the fishing turn around in Richmond? Because it wasn't always like this, correct? Yeah, you know, there's been um, over the years, and I'm not the best history guy. Um, but there was some some serious problems with kind of sewage flow. There was a, a plant that bu- dumped a bunch of uh, chemicals into the James River, and they've definitely had their fair share. The, the James River, you know, um, organizations and nonprofits of protecting the river and kind of making sure that organizations aren't abusing its expansive reach all the way through our state. Um, so <clears throat> I don't know. The you know the James River Association has a lot of really really good facts about the score of the James River and its grade going from, I think it started at like a D minus and it's gotten up to, I think a B in terms of its water quality. And we're working, you know, they're they're always lobbying to kind of make sure we're not including the river even more, but it's been this, you know, kind of changing ecosystem that people are starting to value because when I was growing up and I feel like there's still been even more recently stories of people, you know, don't swim in the James River, it's polluted. And is that kind of what you're kind of alluding to a bit yeah because like and i just remember growing up you drive through richmond and you try to get out of there as fast as possible because because it it wasn't the place to be and in the last i don't know what eight years like richmond has almost changed completely it's it it, the feel the culture of the place and then you also see that in just the local ecosystems everything has changed for the better yeah no i i agree with you whole in in so many ways we're moving past our history a bit um and having some 
understandings of, you know, what Richmond, what it stands for and kind of embracing more inclusive cultures and different views. But with that, yeah, we're at this place where people are doing this amazing world-class art and we're being named like top food destination. We mm -hmm. have, you know, 30, some of the most breweries per capita. Um, so I think Richmond's really coming to terms with what it wants to be moving forward and kind of moving past its, its history and kind of, you know, people say capital of the Confederacy as its, you know, historical standpoint there, but figuring out how it can welcome all types of people and be this space where people can be outside and um, offer, you know, a lot of recreating along a beautiful a river with so many protected trails. Something that I was talking to a friend recently about the James River in Richmond. He said, you know, I live in Denver and it seems like people just throw their trash at our local, you know, along the river in our parks. And there's a lot of, you know, problems with people kind of lingering around the parks, but in the James River park system, I mean, the 30 trails are so, there's so many dedicated crews of people cleaning up trash, maintaining the trails, making sure that it's the space where everyone can feel safe and welcome. And I think that's kind of gone a long way. And with that, we've seen a, a really, really great response in the fishing community as well. I um, mean, yeah, what the work that they're doing, bravo to them, because it's, it's, you're really seeing the fruits of that labor. Uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't ask about it a little bit, but, um, you know, your website shows some striper. So is it, it's not just shad and smallmouth that you can catch there, correct? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And one, it's becoming even more relevant as we kind of get into the spring. So they say when the bait shows up, the big fish show up. So with the, the annual shad run, as, as soon as these shad, start to show up, you know, not far behind them are the striped bass. And you kind of have this toying uh, two ideas in your head when you go to the river, when the shad season kind of starts to wrap up in the middle of the end of April, because you know that what is lurking in the same waters with a little bit bigger <laughs> of a bait is a striped bass. And so to know that, you know, to, to first catch shad all spring and, you know, from now through April and then to just kind of switch gears and to be able to catch these schooly stripers. So the big stripers show up a little bit earlier, but then the, the you know, the real numbers and the schooly fish make their way up, uh, you know, pretty much like mid to late April and early May, there's big striped bass or the, the schooly striped bass come in, but there's still some really big 30 inch plus fish and that same stretch. I mean, if we're being, totally transparent you know that same stretch is kind of where the stripers also turn around that fall line so they'll get a little bit higher up into the rapids and especially later in the season i've caught striped bass i mean little ones in june july because wow. they just kind of get they kind of stay in that really highly oxygenated water and kind of get there's some that even maybe stay around throughout the throughout the year but they follow a similar pattern as the shad they come up with the from the Atlantic Ocean. Some of these fish are swimming all the way up the coast to like Massachusetts and Maine and coming back and then up through the Chesapeake Bay to the James River. They do spend a lot of their life in the, in the Chesapeake Bay and then kind of obviously come up for the for the warmer water in the mid 60s when it gets to be that point. But the striper fishing, I when I was younger, I wasn't as into it, but the past three years, I mean, it's really become something that I've chased with the fly rod. I mean, we are on the banks casting double hauling with a, mm. a shark a chartreuse you know just little little jig clouser minnow and we're catching like i mean there's days we're catching double digit you know nice schooly stripers with you know 10 people along the banks and it's this the community comes together to help other people succeed and we're all just out there i mean thing with the striped bass that's different than the shad the shad you can go i mean high tide low tide this, people forget that the tidal section of the James River stops the fall line. So everything below the fall line is tidal. So, I mean, the shad, you can catch at a low tide, high tide. You'll see the, the river kind of come up along the rocks and it'll drop down significantly at, at low tide. But the striper tend to kind of push up at a high tide and then turn around and kind of go back out into the deeper section of the James at a lower tide. And they also eat in the evening and, and at, at night. So people will get up at four in the morning Holy go out there for the high tide push. I mean, it's, it's intent. The people that striper fish go really hard, but it's great. And, uh, you got to put in your time. I mean, the striper is not as, you know, you can't just go out there a couple times and catch 20 of them. Right. You got to, I mean, you're putting in, I probably went, you know, I'm probably going three or four times a week connecting a couple of the days, but like three or four hours, maybe before, after work, I work downtown. And I know a lot of people maybe that watch your show are, 
you know, how do I find time to fish? You got to be dedicated. Yeah. Go before work, bring your rods. Your rods are always got to be ready in the car and uh, just be ready for it. You can make time for anything you value in your life. You know, what is your commute? So I, to work? Yeah. I, I can get to work in 10 minutes. I can get to work on my bike in 15 minutes. That's not I can bad. get to the river. Yeah. I can get to the river on my bike in about seven minutes and I can get there in my car in about 10, but the river, I can, I'm, I can see it almost from my, from where I work. I'm about five minutes away. So it's right. That, that's the thing that people need to know about the James river. It is right there. You pretty much can't go downtown without crossing the river or seeing hmm. it. And the greatest part is there's not like tons of homes along the river. We have this really, really, really great ecosystem of parks that kind of surround the, the, cent, the, the center of the James river in Richmond in the heart. And so you can just, walk downtown you're on the trails there's not like public you know private property concerns when you're accessing the river in Uh, downtown it's all it's all like fair game awesome i didn't know that cool that was going to be my next question so pretty much uh, guys again besides going to to his website to check it out um there's a lot of opportunities for bank fishing um and it sounds like it's pretty much a year-round fishery which is really really cool what um the one thing up here we have is there's a lot of catfishing opportunities as well and i know i'll get nagged too about that like is that a thing that's actually happening around downtown yes yes that is not my strength but I get a lot of feedback from people saying, you know, <laughs> we have trophy and there's, if you look up James river, you know, Richmond trophy guides, there are tons of them. I mean, people that take you out on their boats and they're catching these trophy blues, trophy channel cats. I mean, really, really big fish, but also, and this is where people are going to be like, I can't believe this in the heart of the city. There's a place called pipeline trail. If you go up there on a flood river, when it's above six, seven, eight feet, muddy stain, and you throw a big four or five inch swim bait, people are catching massive catfish. Like ones you can't, I mean, 30, 40 pounds. Wow. Wow. And I mean, my, one of my friends is, you know, one of those people who swims down there with his hand and he has some GoPro footage that he showed me of just these huge cats just hanging out underneath these big pylons and in these holes. And if you're kind of like new to fishing the James river, my best advice is in the summer, cast behind those big boulders and those big rapid sections because those deep troughs are where those all you know smallmouth are hanging out catfish are hanging out and the stripers are honestly hanging out in the same area so that's the great part about kind of bass fishing there's also really good largemouth fishing uh in the james river i mean we have uh i don't know if you follow the bass master series but we have one that's right down past the, the this the city stretch but we have really good largemouth fishing as well so you never know what you're going to get when you go on the James, but I can tell you, you you'll catch, you'll, you should catch something. <laughs> what are some good breweries and food recommendations too? Cause I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about that either. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So the oldest brewery in Richmond is called legend brewery. I think they have great food and great, a great, uh, great craft beer. They also have the best view of the river and the city. So if you're like, I'm going to Richmond. I want to do everything that screams RVA. Say RVA every time you're here, right? That's what we like to go by. Legend will hook you up with a good beer, a good view. You can kind of talk through your day on the river. Uh, the Veil, I think, gets a lot of popularity uh, across the East Coast, having really good beer. Hardywood's been here for a really long time. Um, you can't go wrong. Those are my three. And Triple Crossing's also really good. And then food, I mean, Stella's is what everyone goes to for the pasta. Hmm. I'm a really big pizza guy. There's a new place called Zorch Pizza, but I love a cozy Joe's Inn little uh, pasta dish downtown. Uh, but we have really good, really good food and, uh, you know, really big names that are winning accolades like, you know, La Possum, Alewife, uh, Grisette have gotten their name on Dang. some of these top charts. So, yeah. So is that, so do you like, that's just, that's really cool. I mean, with, with what you've done here and, and we kind of hinted on it, but now I can corner you with it. Like, what are your plans for this? Cause hopefully you're not like bleeding money with this. I mean, it's such an awesome resource you've built. Do you, what are your future hopes and dreams? Great question. <laughs> so yes, I'm bleeding a little bit of money for paying for the website. So people that don't know, I use Squarespace. They have great templates you can build out for people that I'm actually not a copyright. I'm not a website designer in it by any means. I write a lot of copy and sometimes do for websites. So I'm familiar with writing a lot of different types of content for different clients. But 
Uh, Squarespace has a really good website that you can kind of build from. So I just kind of played around with it and taught myself how to use it. For the future, I think one day I'd like to help people actually get on the river and go back to my guiding days. I know mm. I got to figure out getting a guiding license, but kind of being an alternative for, we have these great, these two guys, Reed and Simone, who opened Current Culture Fly Shop. They would be awesome to speak with as well. They do yes. really good guided trips. I mean, they're awesome. I want to plug them as much as I can. Uh, but just kind of being like an alternative guide service in Richmond for maybe, you know, pe families that want to take their kids fishing or, you know, like working with lower income groups or just kind of exploring ways to get other people into the outdoors and on the river. Um, so that's kind of my next steps one day. Uh, but yeah, we're kind of just, I'm kind of taking it one day at a time. And uh, I'd also like to do some more community events. I want to have a I was supposed to do it this year, but it didn't pan out. I wanted to do a shad tournament where throughout the year, everybody gets a, a poker chip with the RVA James or fishing report on it. And then they take photos with the chip on the shad, you know, just holding it, you know, with the tape measure and whoever has the, the longest shad. Cause you don't really want to like you know, weigh them. Their, their, their uh, mouths are pretty like bony and I don't want to, you don't want to mess them up too much, hmm. put them back. But um, I was thinking of doing like the longest shad and kind of just doing a season long tournament and just, you know, having the proceeds go to some organizations. So some more organ like, you know, community events, you know, speaker series, kind of like what you're doing, just enlightening people about fishing opportunities in this whole DMV area. Um, that's kind of what I hope to do and just be more involved. That's a really cool idea about the shad tournament. I never even thought about doing something like that. That's a brilliant idea to also just bring awareness to that cool fish. Yeah. And I think it would kind of help people. Uh, it would give them more incentive to even go check it out if they're not maybe I could have some prize or some final uh, incentive for people to kind of go give it a try. Cause people are like, Oh, I've heard about that, but you know, never, never done it myself. So what initially got you to want to go out West to guide? That's such a, I don't know, like you're out of college and you're having a midlife crisis kind of thing just to be like, bang, I'm gonna go out there and live off the land. I mean, it's a cool story, but what kind of got you to want to do that? Yeah, it was a hard sale. I've been dating my high school girlfriend since I was, you know, I'm going on year nine here. So I'm also, I'm not, yeah, so it wasn't too long ago that I did this, um, but it was a hard sell. Um, if I'm being honest, though, I've always loved fishing, and I got into fly fishing while I was at Virginia Tech in college, and, mm. you know, the the streams up in the mountains are beautiful. And I, where, where, are you, where are you from? Uh, I'm from uh, Northern Virginia, Loudoun County. Oh, cool. Yeah, cool. born and raised. So, but tech, okay, so you're used to, like, trout country then. Yeah, well, I got used to it. Uh, so I fit, found, I kind of, before going there, I never really fly fished uh, before I went to school. And when hmm. I moved and, you know, was in classes, I kept going to this one stream, the Cascades. Uh, it's a little brook trout stream. I kept hiking alongside it. And I was like, I need to catch these trout. Like everyone was fly fishing and I didn't know what I was doing. So I, uh, I watched like a lot of YouTube and just taught myself. I think that's kind of unique for fly fishing. Most people have gotten it passed down from like their granddad or their grandma or somebody in the family who's kind of been like a traditionalist purist. And remind me, I mean, do you talk about, is fly fishing a lot of your focus or is it people kind of both very varied, your listeners? They're, they're pretty varied. I'm trying to get into fly fishing more and more. It's just really hard because most fly fishermen I, I reach out to, they're very, they're very passionate about just their niche and it's hard to get people to want to share more about it. And I think that's an, an issue with it, I think, um, again, if if anyone's listening and you want to come on and talk about fly fishing, I'm still looking for someone to do a basic a basic one on one thing for kids. So yeah, like so fly fishing, yeah, we definitely do cover that here too. Cool, yeah, and that's something I would like to talk about more because I think there's this fly fishing. Fly anglers think sometimes they have this aura about them that they you know you can't do both, and that you know we have to keep it to our to our uh, the purists of the sport. But I think that there's so much value in doing both and kind of being able to try something new and it kind of helps you fly fishing helps. I'm a very fast paced person. I try to do a couple activities a day and I go 24 seven, but fly fishing makes you slow down. You know, you can only cast a fly rod. You can only cast your fly so fast. You have to get your line out and it's, you know, it's a slow process and uh, compared to spin fishing where you can, you know, cover water really quickly. So fly fishing kind of helps me slow down and, with that, I found myself, you know, fishing 
different holes a little bit differently and the sections of the river differently. But yeah, fly fishing definitely does that because you definitely learn how to read current seams way better and how to present a bait more naturally. And I've always, I've always believed the guys that I know that have a really big fly fishing background, they're way more astute of observing the environment and little things like that. Cause you have to be when you're trying to make that perfect match the hatch presentation. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. And when I was a guide, we did this like, you know, three week crash course, but it was really hard for me to wrap my head around, but my, my mentor, Benji Duke, he's a legend. He runs the expeditions program at the, the ranch. He said, before you get to the river, you know, the first thing you should do, and then you're going to be excited, just going to sit by the river and kind of just see what's happening. You know, you might see a trout rise. You might see, you know, some movement behind a seam you wouldn't, you would otherwise kind of miss. And oftentimes something I'm always reminding myself of is the best fish to be right at your feet. So kind of just that stealthy approach. I think fly anglers definitely have that nailed down. Uh, I try to incorporate that when I'm spin fishing as well, because uh, it's easy to run into the river when you're, you know, God damn, that is some great advice just to sit by the river. Cause we, yeah, we always want to just go, 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 whether it's a boat kayak by bank, we just want to hammer down and get after it, but not just to sit and observe. Like how important is that to actually just sit in nature and just observe things? And that's why, I mean, if everyone, if anyone's uh, wanting to improve their fishing, my advice is always don't necessarily, I mean, you don't have to be a full fledged guide professionally, but go teach someone how to fish because in doing so, you're going to pick up on things you never would have seen. When I was guiding people, a lot of times they were people in their like 60s, 70s that could barely walk. And we were going so slow. And we're at the bottom of the seam and I see the trout rising at the top and I'm like, we got to go. And they would say, Andrew, Andrew, I can't go that fast. We got to slow down. And their pace and their kind of way of seeing the water, I had to adapt to the, what they do and kind of take their speed. And I learned so much to kind of not skip over water. And I was shocked at some of the massive trout that some of these guests I was guiding caught just kind of persistently fishing a hole. My mentality for fishing is like, just cover water and you're going to have better luck. But the people I was with, they were a bit older and just had been fishing for longer really kind of helped me understand that, you know, persistence and kind of placing that, that fly literally on the trout's nose can be a difference maker in having success. So I've slowed down a lot. You, yeah, that's something else that's really big is if you have to teach someone something, you really know, I really believe that the more intelligent you get into a subject, that means the simple things become just just clockwork that can become subconscious. And so what ends up happening is, you know, as you get up further and further and you become like a one percenter, you lose the basics to be able to cognitively remember them. And this is what I mean. If you are a quantum physicist, it's going to be hard for you to teach two plus two because that's also subconscious. You assume everyone else knows it and you're, you're operating at a higher level. Well, when you go back and you have to teach basics to some people, and I saw this a lot when I, when I did a lot of, um, coaching for kids and coaches themselves, they couldn't teach kids the basics because it's been so long since they did it. And that was stuff that they thought was just normal. It was subconscious at that point, clockwork, but taking that subconscious information and then putting it back into the front of your mind, that's hard. And that's what something that is nice about whether you're guiding, I think, or teaching a kid how to fish, you have to, re you have to open back up those skills that were just, that come to you naturally, but not, it doesn't come to everyone naturally. Yeah. I have a question for you. I mean, maybe it's like, is that just, is that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Cool. So how do you describe to somebody when they say, oh, you like fishing? I think there's a stereotype that fishing is sitting on a dock and you don't move around. How do you describe that there's different like tiers of fishing that maybe are a lot more active? Like I'm someone who loves wade fishing and kind of moving and, you know, I kayak fish a lot and I kind of see fishing as like, especially trout fishing, you know, when I'm at the mountain streams, like I'm working the river, I'm going hiking and exploring and fishing at the same time. And I think there's a stereotype people have of like, I'm sitting on a dock and it's really boring. How do you kind of explain that to somebody who's not as familiar with it? What are we talking about age wise? That's the big one. Are we talking about a teenager? Or are we talking more like an adult for an adult, Ad adult, adult, for an adult? I say it is a spiritual journey now because it's the only time in the world we don't have this thing on us. You know, most trout streams, most lakes, you don't have cell service. You got to get rid of technology and you're just sitting there and you're listening. And I think the biggest thing that I think we've done as a, a service in marketing 
is is the red redneck southern hick stereotype when it's more kind of like a hiking commercial that you're disconnecting from from the world and you know it's been scientifically proven that it actually does calm you down and lower your blood pressure to be around water so when you're around there i think again going back to what your mentor said you're unplugging and you have to kind of get back to nature and that's what fishing is about you're right it can be fast paced if we want it to but in general, no matter, you know, unless it's like negative six and you're on, a, it's raining, it's a terrible day. Um, you're just, you're, you're rejuvenating your soul a little bit when you're out there, not to get so, you know, like a ayahuasca Joe Rogan trippy thing, but that's basically what I've always thought it was like. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, uh, and this kind of ties back in your original question about like how I got into guiding. I was with a friend and we were fishing. He was, he was saying it was a friend of a, a mutual friend of mine. And he was telling me that he was going trout fishing for the first time, but uh, he was doing this in preparation of being a guide at this ranch. Cool. And I was thinking, wow, you're going to be a guide at a, at a ranch as a fly, you know, in the fly fishing world. That's, that's really impressive. And he said, yeah, I mean, I'm applying to, we'll see how it pans out. I'm applying, but I'm really passionate about fishing and I have, you know, I'm really excited about this opportunity and just have a lot of enthusiasm and hopefully that'll rub off in the interview. So this mutual friend and I had our first trout adventure together. He caught his first trout. And, you know, in our, in our day journey up in the mountains, we were actually near Abington, Virginia. If you've ever been down there, the creeper trail is, hmm. uh, it's a great, great wild fishery down there. Um, he said to me, he said, you know, I'm going to apply this week. And I said, I'm finishing graduate school. I need to take a break from, you know, being behind the computer and just kind of being online all the time. And I'd love, you know, I was teaching public speaking at the time at Virginia tech to kind of get my degree for graduate school. And I said, if I can teach someone how to give a speech, maybe I can teach them how to how to fly fish. And so I, uh, I when I interviewed, this is what I was kind of segueing back to is the first question my boss, Benji, my mentor said was, why do you fish? And I love that question. I had to take a second there. It's a damn good because question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a simple question, yeah. but it's one, it's not easy. He said, why do you fish? And, you know, I mean, my, I won't go into my answer too much, but to me, fishing is this disconnect. It's this time away from the world where all I'm thinking about is like the water and how I'm going to lure this, this fish to somehow, um, you know, come to my, my, my lure in, in some way. And it's just this, this uh, it's the feeling that's kind of, it's very unique, but it's, it's, it's also aside from catching a fish, it's just the moment of like connecting with nature. And for me, I, I told him that, you know, my dad and I, so my brothers, I have three younger brothers and we all fished together growing up, but it all kind of brought us together in the outdoors. And, um, it's, it's still a really important part of our relationship as, as a family. So, so. so they still fish then your family? Yeah. My dad yeah. fishes with my, uh, my youngest brother has down syndrome and he goes fishing three to four times a week, all local ponds, awesome. the river. My dad takes Johnny's his name fishing every single chance. And Johnny is all about it. He's caught striper. He's caught shad. He's, he's probably caught every single species. Uh, he uses an ugly stick. It's like a six footer with like the maximum flex on it. And he throws a little Mr. Twister in it. He has shown me that Mr. Twisters can catch every species of fish in the James River. They can. They can. <laughs> we overthink bait so much. I mean, I don't, and I don't know if it's the same thing with fly guys, but I do think we over, we overthink everything when it comes to that. But uh, a friend of mine told me once that baits, the baits are there to sell fishermen, not the fish. Like that's why you I love have, that. I mean, that's why you have so many color patterns. There's a book called wisdom of the guides and I had to read it to be a guide. And one of the, it, it's pretty much Q and A's with all these different fly fishing guides from across the U S and they ask them a lot. Do you believe that it's the presentation or the fly? And there's a few guides and I'm, I'm somebody who's a big on the presentation that say, you know, color fly, whatever you have, it doesn't matter. If you can put the fly and present that fly in that perfect drift in front of a trout's mouth, it's going to hit it. Like, you know, trout, are opportunistic fish. They want to eat. And then if you put something in front of them, and I, I believe that too. I mean, I think there is this weird time when we're talking about shad fishing where the green chartreuse spoon seems to be catching all the shad where the guy with the gold isn't catching all the shad. And maybe, you know, there's something, some rhyme or reason to that. And when the water gets stained or the river gets bumped up, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, factors that go into play. But if you can put a grub 
a fly, hmm. that rattle of rattle of rattle traps right in front of a bass or a, whatever species you're going for, I think it's going to hit. But that's just my my take. But the guidebook, they have all of these kind of Q and A debates that go into really good, really good detail. Is which species of trout is the hardest one to catch consistently? <laughs> That is a great question. I think brown trout are the hardest to catch. Really? They're a little bit more, like they're really aggressive, but they're really picky. Uh, I think they're a little harder to find and they're a little easier to spook. That's just my take. Brook trout seem to be, when it's springtime in Virginia and you're going and they're, the river's in good condition and the streams, if you throw any little dry, I mean, you're going to get some some action for me at least. And you can you can drift a, a fly on top of the water nicely. But rainbows there was a thing at the ranch that no one likes rainbows and i kind of became that way i love all, <laughs> all, all i love all fish but brown trout have a special place in my heart uh but cutthroat i think are pretty cool too and they're a little they can be elusive well i i know i know we're up at the clock here but i want to is do you have one quick story from your guiding days that, that comes to mind who <laughs> i got lots of stories a short one got a short story for you okay so it was i think the fifth week i was at the ramps the fifth series of guests and we had i don't know i have i have two stories but i'll go with this one because it, i think it demonstrates um if people that want to be guides what you can your energy and enthusiasm can have and it kind of represents my personality i think but we had a, a group of four CEOs. They were all CEOs. And something we have, we see a lot of at the, at the Abari Ranch is these guests. It's not the most, it's, it's very expensive to go there, unfortunately, which I wish they would make it so we could have all types of people from different backgrounds able to afford it. And maybe they will in some way. But a lot of people that go to the ranch are very, very, very wealthy. And with that, they're often CEOs who spend every second of the day on the phone. I mean, they are wired. These people are like to the, you know, just working super hard late hours and so when oftentimes when they arrive at the ranch especially on their on our expedition program um it takes them a few days to like unwind from being on and like being a ceo 24 7. Hmm. uh so when they start their trip they they arrive and they take a horseback they ride horse up to our cabin it's about a four mile ride so it takes about an hour it might be a little bit longer i don't know how many miles exactly but they take this kind of slow trot from the, the headquarters up into the mountain and we're waiting for them. We've unloaded all their luggage and our private chef has made them apps and it's all set up. And so that, you know, they have no cell service. We, nice. the ranch could hook up the AT&T cell, you know, cell provider, but they've decided they don't want to have anyone connected to, to service in any way. It's really cool. Smart. Tradition. Yeah. Um, and I was really nervous because I was going to be able to talk to my girlfriend unless I hiked three miles up the mountain, which I had to do sometimes, but I made it work. Lots of, uh, Lots of good catch-ups on, on top of a mountain. But anyways, they the, the four CEOs, it was their first, uh, they're doing like a, a meetup retreat. It was the first time they met in like, I think four years. And so they were really excited to all be together. And the night they all arrived, they were, you know, we had an early dinner so they could go fishing after dinner. That was something that the cabin was located right by the stream. And uh, we wanted to make sure that our experience was, accommodating to people that get they arrive at the ranch they don't want to talk they just want to get on the water so we had our quick dinner they were sharing stories you know i i made the mistake of asking uh one of the guests you know where's the best place you've been he said i you know everest was great mount everest and i was like oh my god that's so cool who do we have on our hands here so anyways we walked down but this this guy's name was ned and ned and all his friends that he was with there was one of four they all were fl fly anglers and he had never fly fished before he said andrew I've never fly fished. I've hiked Everest or done Everest, but I've never fly fished. I'm pretty nervous. I was like, you're going to do great. We go down to the river. He's got these clunky waders on. He's doing the like really bad wrist movement. You know, you want to keep your wrists nice and straight. And he's slapping the water. And we fish for, I think, an hour and a half as the sun's going down. Trout are literally rising everywhere. I mean, they're gosh, just like everywhere you see. It's like sprinkles. And he's just slapping the water. Finally. After about an hour and a half, he lands a fly. It doesn't drag in the current. And a, a small, maybe 12-inch rainbow comes up and eats his fly. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you have a trout. And, he, you know, he's, he's happy. He's pleased. 
I scoop the net up. I'm like, let's go. You got a trout. Like, that is this awesome. Is your first trout. He's, he's pumped. He's pumped. Or I'm pumped. He's happy. <laughs> and that night he comes back and we're, you know, sitting around. The, the, there was no you know, TV or anything. We're sitting around telling stories. And he tells my boss, Benji. He says, Benji, I want to tell you. Today I caught my first trout. And I was happy. But he said, when I saw Andrew's reaction and him just going crazy, that made me excited for this week because I saw the joy and that enthusiasm and it came to me and I'd realized this was a big moment. And Ned caught fish all week. He caught a, almost a 20 inch rainbow trout. Nice. And that moment of like, if I can get someone excited that isn't really that keyed in on this idea of fly fishing or any type of fishing or going to the James river, then I've done my job and maybe I've helped someone have a good experience. So if nothing else, that story kind of represents my, uh, yeah, my just beliefs about you're enthusiastic about something, but you clearly are in your podcast and this great show. Uh, other people will get excited and kind of enter something that maybe they'll love forever. Guys, I, I, I that's a perfect place right there. I can't top that. I mean, Andrew, that is such a great story. Um, I love everything that you've built and you continue to do. Please, guys, link in the episode description to all of his social media accounts and his website. Please help support him and try to bring awareness to this, this, this great work that he's doing so he can retire early and become a guide again. Um, Andrew, is there anything <laughs> anything else you'd like to plug before before we go here? No, I mean, I love this. I've thought about doing a podcast and telling like, sharing James River fishing stories from Richmond, but you just got it dialed down so well. You asked such great questions. Um, you set the bar and maybe inspired here. So maybe we'll see some other formats for sharing some, some fishing tales. Um, but thank you so much for having me on. I and mean, this has been such a, this has been the joy of my week and I'm going to tell every, all my friends and family <laughs> about this. So I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for coming on guys. We might be talking here a little bit more, but uh, we're good here. Like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.